Dear friends, on behalf of the SVD Australia province and the mission education and research team, I'd like to welcome each and all to our second lecture of a series of six lectures on mission and dialogue today. Our first lecture offered by Albano da Costa was a success with about 100 participants from six countries. If you wish to watch that video, it is available on our website. And the presenter for our lecture today is Professor Roger Schrader. First of all, Roger is a member of the Society of the Divine Wood, Chicago province, as a missionary and a practical anthropologist, Roger spent six years working with and learning from indigenous peoples in remote village areas of Papua New Guinea in the 70s and 80s. He has made a great contribution through his areas of interest, both in ministries and in scholarship. For scholarship, Roger won a Master of Divinity from the Catholic Theological Union Chicago in 1979, a licentiate in missiology in 1983, and a doctorate in missiology in 1990, both of these, these from the Pontifical Gregorian University, Rome. As a professor of mission and culture, and a professor of interculturality and ministry, Roger has been committed to research, teaching, writing, mentoring, and practice in areas of mission and intercultural ministry from the perspectives of the post-Vatican II de developments, and most recently under the inspiration of Pope Francis. Roger published many books and articles on mission studies, dialogue, and interculturality. His recent book entitled Christian Tradition in Global Perspective, published in 2021, received third place of for excellence in publishing a word in theology by the Association of Catholic Publishers and it was selected as one of the 10 outstanding books in mission studies, intercultural theology, and world Christianity for 2021 by the Ecumenical Overseas Ministry Study Center of Bryston Theological Seminary. Roger is an associate ed editor of the International Bulletin of Mission Research and on the ed Editorial Committee for the Scholarly Monograph Series of the American Society of Missiology. He is currently serving his sixth three years term as the coordinator of Anthropos Institute of the Society of the Divine Wood. Since 1990, Roger has been teaching at the Catholic Theological Union Chicago and holding uh, the chair of Louis J. Lusbitek, SVD Professor of Mission and Culture of Intercultural Studies and Mission at the Catholic Theological Union, Chicago, USA. Friends, let us welcome Roger, who will present to us a special topic today on prophetic dialogue and interculturality. Welcome and thank you, Roger. Thank you very much, uh, Tien, for that very nice uh, uh, introduction. And I feel very humbled by what you shared. And it's very nice to have one of my former students from Y2U uh, some 20 some years ago to be introducing me and to be leading this. Um, Murr series of lectures. So thank you very much, Tien. I appreciate that. Um, 
As we begin here, um, I'm going to, first of all, we acknowledge here in Sydney, acknowledgement of the Walumudega people of the Daru tribe, the traditional custodians of the land. I've been working many years with indigenous peoples around the world, and I appreciate the way that Australia honors and acknowledges the indigenous peoples of the land on which we are. So thank you. So I'm going to be giving, here's the outline of what I'll be presenting today. Um, the first of all, after an introduction, we'll then look at the two major components of the talk. One is interculturality from both the social science and missiology perspective. Then we will look at the second dialogue partner, that of prophetic dialogue of the different dimensions. Part three, we then bring the two of them together. How do they complement each other? Then in section four, talk about the anthropos tradition of the Arnotas family, and then what are the implications? So in the introduction, I'm going to talk about how these themes have been surfaced within the SVD community. And as I do this, I really want to encourage those who are not members of the Arnotas family to realize that even though it comes out of that particular context and situation, that these themes are very important for all Christians. And there are many Catholics and Protestants around the world who are engaging these topics as well, both prophetic dialogue and interculturality. But I need to situate my own self, my own self-location. So as an SVD, the last four general chapters have been dealing with these two topics. The first chapter, 15th chapter in the year 2000, introduced the topic of prophetic dialogue within the ministry, ad extra. The following chapter in 2006 looked at prophetic dialogue within religious community life. I'll be talking about this later in the presentation. 17th general chapter in 2012 focused explicitly on interculturality, both within and the community and in ministry. And in the last general chapter of the SBDs in 2018, it was a spiritual renewal looking back on these previous three chapters. And for example, in that document, paragraph 27, it states, as you see on the screen, striving to live as truly intercultural communities is already a key element of our SVD mission. So it reaffirmed it and grounded it further in spirituality. And then as another member of the Arnotas family, the SSBS, the Holy Spirit Missionary Sisters. They also have been on this track in terms of interculturality explicitly. Already in 1987, I was surprised at my research to find such an early reference to interculturality. So this was their first General Assembly of Provincials. And in there, they talked about the capacity for intercultural living is a non-negotiable aspect of SSPS life. So it's wonderful, huh? Years later, in their general chapter of 2008, they talk particularly, we are intercultural and interconnected communities, not for its own sake, but in and for mission. We are challenged to move from dominance to mutuality, from adaptation to integration. The following chapter in 2014, they talked about widening the circle of communion. Here they extended it, not just to human beings, but to all creation, people who are marginalized and all others. And in their last chapter in the post COVID period, 2022, one of their statements, one of their directions, number three, we vow to radically live our consecration to intercultural, international, and intergenerational communities. So after that introduction and sort of setting the context of where this emerges from my own social location, we'll now move now to talk briefly to introduce interculturality. 
So the meaning of interculturality moves beyond mere coexistence to emphasize and make more explicit the essential mutuality, mutuality a key word, of the process of cultural interaction on both the personal and social levels. This is a quote from Bob Casella, SVD, working in Japan. The second quote comes from my SVD colleague, Vietnamese American, Van Tang Nguyen. He talked about moving beyond cross-cultural, going in one direction, to mutual multi-dimensional exchange and enrichment. So again, how do we move beyond tolerance? Beyond tolerance, beyond cross-cultural, but to the idea of intercultural. Huh? Sometimes the one image that's often used when talking about culture is that of a iceberg. In an iceberg, 15% is above the water level that can be seen. So with a culture, that would be the language, the dress, the food, those things that we can see. But what we see above the water level is based upon what's below the water level. What is the world view? with the values, with the expectations, with the fears, with the, 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 the vision of a culture, the worldview. So every culture is very worthwhile. It is, is a gift. Every community needs it. Huh? But we start by looking at the what's on the surface, but then the challenge in interculturality is to understand the worldview of the other from their perspective. That's the challenge. Now, as we look at this theme of interculturality, I'm gonna begin with the social sciences who began looking at interculturality explicitly before we did in theology and in terms of ministry and mission. They looked at it from three different areas. So the social scientists, first of all, moving from ethnocentrism to ethno-relativism. The way ethnocentrism is understood here is that while we are to be proud of our culture and who we are, but when we use our culture to judge others, to discriminate against them, that's when it leads to the problems. So as Rinkovich wrote in that first quote I have, each culture can be understood and appreciated only in its own context. So in its own context, not judged from another context. The image I have on the upper left are six stages in the process of transformation by an anthropologist, social scientist, Milton Bennett. Here he has six stages on the left from denial of differences, everyone is like me, to the final stage on the right of integration, a full respectful mutual respect of others. The second area of the social scientists was that of moving from colonialism to decoloniality. And as quoted there, the differences of human beings are not cast in terms of values of pluses and minuses, degrees of humanity. Huh? People are not less or more human. We're all fully human. Also, SM Michael, SVD of India, it's moving beyond the colonial understanding of Christian mission. So this idea, as we know of colonialism, was linked to mission in the 19th and 20th centuries. Huh? The third area that the social scientists use to talk about interculturality is moving from globalization to mutual respect and power among cultures. The idea is to avoid the extremes of a smothering metaculture of globalization and the response of particular and often violent fundamentalism. These are two of the dynamics that happen in globalization. Globalization is complicated. I can't go into more detail here, but I think we have a general sense of what that is. So as I wrote in an article in 2013, 
The social sciences highlight the potential of true interculturality for contributing to the creation of a world in which individuals, communities, and nations interact in a more appropriate and mutually enhancing fashion. This is wonderful, isn't it? These are the social scientists who are talking about the importance of developing mutual relationships in the face of ethnocentrism, colonialism, and globalization. Now we turn to the mythological theological perspective on interculturality. Vatican II was a key shift from, quote, the old auroric paternalistic model of mission associated with a colonialism of reaching down to save and help another person to a model of humility and mutuality, developing a reciprocal relationship out of respect for how God is already present in the other. Huh? This is our theological belief. This is the teaching of the Catholic Church. God's presence in all peoples and all creation. Vatican II also had a positive assessment of all culture. And as we later developed, every culture, every culture contains both the seeds of the word of God and elements contrary to the reign of God. One of the images I use is that of entering the worldview or the garden of the other, which has seeds and weeds. The seeds of the word of God, the weeds of those elements contrary to the reign of God. So true intercultural interaction, quote, is crucial for mutual enrichment and for the recognition of the continual call to conversion for all. So in interculturality, we are enriched by the other, but we're all called, all of us, there's no Christian culture, all of us are called to conversion more into the image of how we are created in God. In terms of mission, explicitly, after Vatican II, there was a shift in the understanding of mission. Before Vatican II, it was the West to the rest. So that was going from North America, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, to the rest of the world, to the non-Western world. Now the shift is moving from that to say that mission is on all six continents. God's mission is calling all people back to God and to be transformed. Vatican II stated it clearly in saying the church is missionary by nature. Therefore, every local church is both mission sending and mission receiving. I went to work in Papua New Guinea as a missionary coming from the United States. And now Brother Alu is an SVD brother from Papua New Guinea who's doing missionary work 10 minutes from me in Chicago, in Our Lady of Africa Parish. So both churches, all local churches, are mission sending and mission receiving. This idea of interculturality. Also the idea of agentes, which is a common term used with mission. And there are now some missiologists and theologians who are saying rather than to the nations, among the nations because God's grace is amongst all the nations. Jonathan Tan is, is an Asian, Catholic Asian theologian. Um, Bill Burroughs is a former SVD theologian. Tony Pernia, Filipino, former SVD general uh, superior. So what I see here in proposing is that there's a real complementarity of the social scientists and the mythological, theological perspectives and studies. Huh? The two of them really complement each other. So now to talk in terms of mission as prophetic dialogue. This is the other partner, interculturality. Now we talk about prophetic dialogue. So in the 15th general chapter, which I mentioned earlier, the idea of prophetic dialogue emerged in the conversations. It wasn't something said before the chapter. It would happen in the process. So in that chapter, a large group of the SVD missionaries were either from Asia, working in Asia, 
and they talked about mission as dialogue. This is very much in the context of Asia. The Federation of Asian Bishops Conferences, FABC, talked about mission as dialogue, dialogue with the poor, with other cultures and other religions. The Latin Americans and those working in Latin America came with the understanding of mission as through their bishops' conferences, Ceylon, that mission is prophecy, speaking out on behalf of the poor, speaking out against that what keeps the poor poor, what are the systemic evils in that way. So these two groups of SVDs came together, one emphasizing dialogue, one emphasizing prophecy. In the process of that chapter, coming out of that discernment by various SVDs working around the world, what it formed was to talk about prophetic dialogue, which includes both elements. Here is the quote from paragraph 44 of that document. It is in dialogue that we are able to recognize the signs of God's presence and the working of the Spirit in all people. And together with our dialogue partners, we hope to hear the voice of the Spirit of God calling us forward. In this way, our dialogue can be called prophetic. So in that dialogue, we're all called to conversion. And even having dialogue with various peoples different than ourselves is a prophetic action. My colleague Steve Bevins, SVD, and I wrote a book that was published in 2004 on the theology and history of mission. And in that, as we were working on that last chapter in 2002, we thought that the idea of prophetic dialogue was a way, a framework in which to put the major, three major Catholic theologies of mission that have happened in the last 60 years. Those three theologies are the Missio Dei theology, Trinitarian theology of Vatican II, the liberating service of the reign of God of Pope Paul VI, Evangelii Nunciandi, and proclamation of Jesus Christ as universal savior of John Paul II, Redemptoris Missio. I don't have time here today to go back to the theologies but just to say that on a theological level, prophetic dialogue is able to bring together the richness and a complementarity of mission theologies. Later on in 2011, Steve and I published a book. It's, there's an image of the cover of the book to the right on prophetic dialogue because many people were talking about prophetic dialogue, but we tried to give some theological and practical implications of what this means. We also talked about the spirituality. So theology, practice, and spirituality. So I'm going to now spend time to talk about both elements. The first as mission as dialogue. A major shift in Vatican II, moving from the previous understanding of mission to a new understanding of mutuality. So as Donald Doerr, a theologian of South Africa, wrote, there is a two-way exchange of gifts, mutuality, between missionaries and the people among whom they work. Mission is not just a matter of doing things for people. It is, a, first of all, a matter of being with people, of listening and sharing with them, because God's Spirit is there. This is where we bring together both theology and practice. Our theology makes a difference and between doing and being. St. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians, we were gentle among you like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children. We are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you are very near to us. A beautiful statement of dialogue because of the love. Pope Paul VI wrote the document Ecclesium Sum during Vatican II. It's not a Vatican II document, but this document represented one of the major shifts during Vatican II. 
As Pope Paul VI wrote, it seems to us that the sort of relationship for the church to establish with the world should be more in a nature of a dialogue. This is a major shift. Maybe for those who were born many years after Vatican II don't realize what a significant shift it was. Later on, a document from the Vatican in 91 wrote mission, quote, implies a certain sensitivity to the social, cultural, religious, and political aspects of the situation. This is where we're going to go back to the interculturality, huh? paying attention to the context. And also attentiveness to the signs of the times through which the Spirit of God is speaking, teaching, and guiding. It's a theological aspect. Such sensitivity and attentiveness are developed through a spirituality of dialogue. The importance of the spirituality that accompanies this. As a theological base, we look at the, the Trinity. Base of this, the image I have here is the beautiful um, image that's behind the altar in Alice Springs at the church where the SVDs are ministering. An image, an aboriginal image of the Trinity. So God, just as God is dialogue, is dialogical in God's self, three persons in one, and present in the world, so the church, as a sacrament of God's presence, needs to learn from the world, its cultures, its religions, God's unfathomable riches. Huh? This applies both to intercultural living of the SSBS, SVD, and other religious orders, and parish life, communities, dioceses, and to our mission work, our work that is focused on the mission of God. An image we can use about this, I use, is taking off one's shoes. When I go to visit a Vietnamese family in St. Louis, I see the shoes outside the door, and I know what I'm supposed to do. I take off my shoes so I don't drag the dirt of the street or off my own feet into someone's home. If you go to a mosque, you also take off your shoes of respect. The missiologist of the 20th century, Max Warren, said, when we enter the world of the other, we take off our shoes, lest we risk trampling upon where God is already present. So a very spirit of humility. A few images of dialogue. One would be a treasure hunter, someone who, amongst the people, looks for those treasures of where God is already present, so that everyone, the people and the tread and the both the missionary and the people, can be enriched. The second image is that being a guest or in somebody else's world. When you're a guest, you need to accept hospitality, and to need to know when to offer a helping hand. Huh? This, again, is a dialogical perspective, starting with humility. The third image is that of being a stranger. Not being strange, but being a stranger, so you're in another world. The image on the bottom, on the left, points to a person who's in a world that is very different for them. Huh? Okay. And an opportunity for a relationship. Huh? It opens the door in that way. Now we'll look at the image of prophecy. So what is that element in prophetic dialogue? So mission is and must also be prophetic because God's inner nature is also prophetic. So as we're called back to God, we are to be transformed and changed into that image in which we are created in God's image. Huh? This is the prophetic side of it. Huh? The Spirit anoints prophets, quote from Isaiah, to speak God's word faithfully, to bring good news to the oppressed, healing to those who are discouraged, liberty to captives, release the prisoners, comfort to those who mourn, a condemnation to those who have betrayed the covenant. Huh? So this is that prophetic word calling us to be transformed, to bring the good news to the oppressed and marginalized. At the bottom of the screen, in the white print, 
I have stated their prophetic mission is not forceful proselytism. When I talk about prophecy in a place like India, which has a very strong resistance to anything to do with colonialism and to people who were proselytized, in other words, they were forced, forced proselytism, forced to be baptized either implicitly or explicitly by offering food or exchange of different benefits. Huh? So prophetic prophecy does not mean anyone being forced to be baptized. Huh? Jesus was a eschatological prophet. He preached, demonstrated, and embodied the reign of God. Huh? So when he preached the first time in his hometown, he says, as I speak, the reign of God is happening now. Talking about the breaking in of the reign of God. Paul, in this case, talking about prophecy, he said in 1 Thessalonians also, he drew courage through our God to speak to you, the truth to you, the gospel of God. And in Romans, not ashamed of the gospel. So Paul was one who represented both the, the dialogical approach of love to people and also the prophetic word. So what is this prophecy? First of all, prophecy must be rooted in dialogue. That dialogue is listening to God's word, of course, first. Listening to God's word in the society and the people around us, the signs of the times, as stated in Gaudi Mespez, and being attentive to people and to context. There are two different components or dimensions of prophecy. The first is speaking forth, annunciation, announcing that reign of God. This is when people don't recognize that God is present with and without words. We think of the Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones as he pointed to the bones and he said, they have life, flesh is coming to them. They are going to come forth. The reign of God is coming and a message of action and good news and hope. Huh? That's announcing that word of God. When we offer hope, that's a message, annunciation. So for example, as we are sitting, wherever you're sitting at, as you listen to this, there are radio waves that are going through the room in which you are. But you need a radio, a radio to tune in to that message. So we are, through prophecy, tuning in to that message of God that is there. The other aspect of prophecy is denunciation, with and without words, talking against those things that are contrary to God's reign, to those aspects of injustice or a narrow understanding of religion, or unfaithfulness in one's religion. But when we do that, we do it like Jesus, when he went for Jerusalem, it was out of love. So what we see here is that prophecy is a theology. It's played out in practice, and it must be based on a spirituality, a deep spirituality. The two images I have on the screen in the upper right, here we have Mother Teresa at the tomb of Gandhi. Both of them are very strong prophetic figures. Mother Teresa saw those dying in the streets of Calcutta, and said that they are full human beings that deserve to die in dignity. She was making a very prophetic statement. Gandhi spoke about nonviolence, bringing about the independence and also fighting injustices in the Indian society that were there. And he did in a nonviolent, a very prophetic stance. Huh? Here we have the two of them meeting together. The bottom right hand corner of the screen is a Invitation to professional religious vows. For those of us in religious vows, professing religious vows, this is prophetic statements that we are making. It's countercultural. What are some of the images of the prophetic element? A teacher is someone who has something to teach. Yes, there's a community of learners. The teacher also learns, but the teacher has something to say. A storyteller is someone also who has something to say through a story. 
And this is something that provides, strengthens our identity, and it also can challenge us and lead us to a deeper meaning of life. The story of Jesus in the early church. Or a trail guide. A trail is someone who knows the way, how to read maps and signs. Huh? So a prophet is also someone who can point to the way to follow. And as we know, Christians were known as followers of the way at the beginning. Huh? So now we bring those two together, prophetic dialogue together, those two elements. Huh? And I think there needs to be a balancing between the two. Hmm? Both of them are important in any form of ministry. So the Asian bishops, as I mentioned before, after Vatican II, talked about mission as dialogue. But then, I don't know, about 15 years after Vatican II, they realized that dialogue is not enough. There also has to be a prophetic element in each of those dimensions. So, first of all, we dialogue with the poor and we speak out against what keeps the poor that way. We dialogue with other cultures and we critique those elements of every culture that are contrary to God's reign, those weeds. We dialogue with other religions and we maintain the conviction that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Huh? To holding those two together. David Bosch, a South African missiologist who died in 91 in a car crash, in one of his later articles talked about mission as bold humility or humble boldness. We know only in part, so we have to be humble. We only know in part how God is working. But we do know something. That's the boldness, not our personal boldness, but the boldness of the reign of God, of the good news. Huh? Steve and I see a clear connection between prophetic dialogue. Prophetic dialogue. Dialogue is that humility, spirituality of humility, of how God is present in ways we don't recognize at first. The prophecy is that boldness, the boldness of the good news. Okay, we spent time to introduce the two dialogue partners here, interculturality and prophetic dialogue. What happens when you bring them together? First of all, when we bring prophetic dialogue together, it shapes interculturality. It provides a Trinitarian theology, which is dialogical in terms of the positive attitude to culture, that God is much bigger than we imagine, and also the prophetic element. The Trinitarian theology provides us with the great basis for both denunciation and annunciation in every context. Prophetic dialogue also points to a practice, promoting mutual enrichment and critique and to avoid claims of cultural superiority and dominance by either a global power of a particular individual or a group. Huh? And prophetic dialogue provides a very rich spirituality, a spirituality of discernment of God's spirit, discerning the seeds and the weeds, and humility and boldness, to use David Bosch's terms. Huh? There has to be a deep spirituality behind this. At the same time, interculturality contributes to a prophetic dialogue in that it helps to understand the context that we're talking about. The social scientists talked about it in terms of ethnocentrism, post-colonialism, and globalization. So we need to understand our world in order to engage it in a proper way. It impacts every form and it helps us in every area of mission, the methodologies. Here I list on the screen six of those areas that Steve Bevins and I have identified within Catholic teachings and writings, the six components of mission that together are different elements of responding to God's mission. Witness and proclamation, 
liturgy, prayer, contemplation, justice, peace, integrity, creation, interreligious and secular dialogue, enculturation, and reconciliation. Interculturality is necessary for all of those. If you're doing catechesis, you need to understand what is the culture, generational differences, huh? in any kind of area you're dealing with. And those are that's the odd extra in ministry. But interculturality also provides a methodology for dealing with aspects within religious life. I mentioned five dimensions within religious life. Formation, community life, leadership, spirituality, and finances. The SVD and SSBS have done two to three week formation programs in English and Spanish on the areas of formation and spirituality. So this again, those are two of the areas that we've looked at so far in a very specific way. Now I move to, again, back more explicitly to the SVD and SSBS, the Arnoldus family, the Anthropos tradition, um, which I can't go into a lot of detail here, but from the very beginning, um, Wilhelm Schmidt was an anthropologist and linguist. He was one of the first in the first generation of SVDs, and he brought the importance of understanding language and culture to into the SVDs. Arnold Jansen, the founder of the Arnoldus family of SVD, SSBS, and Adoration Sisters, he endorsed and supported the study of other cultures and religions to really understand them and to see how God is speaking in ways that many people at those days in the 19th and early 20th century did not recognize. They started a journal, Anthropos Journal, and also the Anthropos Institute. And then we have St. Joseph Fernandes, also of the founding generation, who went to um, China and at that time, he began with a very negative attitude towards the Chinese and their culture, their society. But as time went on, he went to Shandong province. He visited families in their homes. And he began to realize how respectful he was of who they were as Chinese people. And at the end, he wanted to become, die as a Chinese. Huh? Yeah. And I just want to mention here from the SSBS, Mother Teresa Mesner, who was the first SSBS Superior General. I have her pictured here at the bottom right. She wrote during World War I. World War I, when sisters were living together, but they came from countries that were at war with each other and living in countries that were also in the midst of the war. And she wrote, if we wish to become missionary sisters, we have to adjust to the customs and uses of the foreign peoples. Huh? So we need to adapt. However, also in relation to World War I, whoever we wish, whoever we may be, whether German, Dutch, Austrians, British, Russians, or Americans, we, dear sisters, are all children of the one great family of God. She wrote this a month after the end of World War I. A very prophetic figure talking about we can't let our national sensitivities ruin what God is calling us to do. So in terms of this Anthropos tradition, um, coming out of the Anthropos Institute, we now talk about it beyond just an institute. The institute still exists, the journal is still being published after 117 years. But again, how does that impact who we are as missionaries and for all of us as Christians. So Tony Pernia, uh, the Superior General from the Philippines, I quoted him earlier. He actually was the first non-Western Superior General of the SVD community. He wrote, our Anthropos tradition is really a way of doing mission, which considers an appreciation of people's culture as a necessary precondition for genuine evangelization whereby the missionary is ready not just to change people, but to be changed himself. Huh? That's the mutuality, huh? mutual transformation on both sides, enrichment and challenge by all. 
The pictures I have here, Ennio Montavani, who is currently in the Sydney community of the SVDs, played a major role in the reorganization of the Anthropos Institute and in leading us into this broader understanding of the Anthropos tradition. Below his picture is Louis Lusbitek. I hold that chair in Catholic Theological Union, an SVD linguist and anthropologist. And he wrote a book very much about church and cultures. He wrote this already during the time of Vatican II. Again, pointing to it. Huh? This idea applies both within our communities and in our mission. S.M. Michael, who is an anthropologist, missiologist in India and in Mumbai at the moment, he wrote the following. Will the present SVD generation understand the pioneering work of the Anthropos tradition and get energized to be creative in today's mission? How do we continue this today? Understanding cultures and languages and in a very respectful way. So bringing these together now as we move towards the end, bringing together interculturality and prophetic dialogue, that was the theme of this talk, moves beyond a mere instrumentalist understanding. So it's not just taking pieces or finding a recipe amongst the social sciences for a quick fix, no. But a real, what's the relationship of the social sciences and mission? How can it be really deeply complementary? I think both are grounded in the Trinitarian theology. They both are pointing towards a link between theory, theology, practice, and spirituality. I like to talk about this as head, heart, and hands. The head is the theory, the knowledge. The heart is the spirituality, our attitudes, our approach, practice, our hands. Huh? How do we do that? Head, heart, and hands. So both prophetic dialogue and interculturality see the need for a process of transformation and conversion of perspectives and attitudes. John Kirby, a member of Anthropos Institute, the current provincial of the Western province of the United States, talked about cross-cultural conversion. John Pryor, many years of Indonesia, who died recently, he talked about intercultural conversion. So conversion is key for all of us. So, in summary, prophetic dialogue contributes theology, practice, and spirituality. Interculturality contributes content, methodology, and training for understanding the context, giving us the skills. The two belong together. They can enrich and complement each other. These came together in general chapters of the SVD. I think it's very prophetic that they did. And I think they really can give us, not just us, but I think Christians, missionaries around the world, Catholics and Protestants, a real vision and inspiration. They need to be in touch with the source of creativity, which is the spirit. I have just a couple questions at the end for your own reflection. How is interculturality affirming and or challenging for yourself in your current work and ministry? Think of some concrete situations. That's the interculturality. And how do you see the connection between interculturality and mission as prophetic dialogue? How do you see that in your own situation? So I've come to the end of my presentation here. I'm Again, I'm thankful to you, uh, Tien, and to the SVDs for allowing me to be a part of this series. And I think it's, uh, I hope that what I've presented here can offer some helpful reflection points for all peoples, not just for those who are members of the Arnotis family, but for all of us to reflect upon how we can more fully participate in what God is about. Thank you very much. Could you uh, stop sharing that? Um, this is not a, a formal response to your lecture. Uh, uh, Roger, yeah. but uh, thank you very much for your very interesting lecture. Your presentation was very clear, 
insightful and challenging. You covered a wide range of areas of scholarship from social science perspective on interculturality, um, prophetic dialogue, to missiological and uh, theological perspective on interculturality and on that dialogue, with a shift in uh, mission by Vatican II, and with a very positive assessment of culture. You emphasize the church as missionary by its very nature. Mission is not only doing, but also being. I like that idea. Yeah. That concept. Yeah. 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 And you also explore the idea of mission as prophetic dialogue, which is a real reflection of what the SVDs and Holy Spirit sisters are trying to embrace in their lives and their missions today. And you view dialogue as spirituality with a focus on the Trinity as the foundation of dialogue. And we cannot escape that. That is real, truly foundation for our mission and dialogue. And you demonstrated this uh, spirituality in different images. And I like the idea of taking one shoes, one's shoes off as one enters the other's garden. I love that idea. Oh, yeah. Very beautiful Good. and meaningful. And your understanding of mission as prophecy is challenging. This brings us to the core of our mission with focus on annunciation and denunciation. I think this is uh, something very new to me. Annunciation and denunciation. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and you brought dialogue and prophecy together in a very, very meaningful, creative, and practical way. You provided not only the content, context of interculturality and prophetic dialogue, but also on methodology and training of what you call the tools for how to apply interculturality and prophetic dialogue in a very practical way. And for this, I like the idea of head, heart, and hand. Yeah, it's a quite holistic uh, uh, concept. And in short, your lecture touched every aspect of who we are as missionaries, or you said as Christians, and what we are called to do in our life and in our mission. So a big thank you to you for such a wonderful and insightful conversation uh, uh, Roger and uh, and and we hope that uh, you continue to make your contribution in our next series uh, so thank you very much okay thank you very much you're welcome Tia and blessings upon all of you as all of us journey together um, how do we respond in our own individual context to where God is calling us thank you very much yeah thank you